Welcome to the Business Builder Show with Marty Wolf. And my name is Marty Wolf, and I am the host of this show. And I am joined today by an old friend of the Business Builder Show, and his name is Ian Sanders. Hi, Ian. How are you, sir? Hi, Marty. It's good to be here again. I think we were just in the green room just trying to work it out. I think it was uh, three years ago we had our last chat. So good to be back. Thank you for having me back. I'm thrilled. I've been following your work. You made such an impression on me. Of course, we'll give uh, a kudos and a reach out to our mutual friend, Kelly Hoey, who started our relationship. I'm uh, grateful for everything that Kelly has done with and for me through her work and building her dream network. And she's made me part of her, her dream network. So it's been great. Great having you. So uh, short introduction. Ian Sanders is, is an author, creative consultant, and storyteller who works with some of the world's leading organizations. Throughout his professional life, Ian has experimented with life-enhancing habits and hacks. It's resulted in two decades worth of conversations, detours, and journals. We might talk about some of those detours. And now, whether it's working with teams in global organizations or with a founder who's just getting started, Ian aims, excuse me, and Ian aims to spark change with his fifth book, which is titled 365 Ways to Have a Good Day. He hopes to inspire people to spark change in their own lives and to get more out of every single day. Ian, I picked up on something that I uh, detected that I don't believe you're from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You kind of talk differently than they do in Philadelphia. So (laughs) where do you call home? Well, here I am, 40 miles to the east of London, and uh, if I just sit up like that, I can see see the Thames estuary. Um, so yeah, just uh, we 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 can see all the container ships coming up to the uh, the the big Thames Gateway uh, port here. So uh, I'm by the coast, by the beach, but uh, on a good day, 45 minutes into the centre of London by train. So it feels quite a good place to be. Yeah, you talk a lot about it in your work and in the book, and uh, maybe we'll talk about some of your visits and your trips and your travels, you know, during this conversation. But the book has been out, and again, I'm going to say it again, 365 Ways to Have a Good Day. Subtitle says, A Day-by-Day Guide to Living Your Best Life. Well, I'm always interested in learning ways to lead my best life, and uh, you're giving me 365 ways to do it. The book has been out for some time, but just recently released in the United States and Canada. Am I accurate there, Ian? Yes, you're right. Uh, I think the day we're recording this is four weeks uh, to the day that it's come out in the U.S. and Canada. And in the U.K., it came out in November 2021. So been a bit, been out a bit longer uh, over here. So how's it going? What's the feedback been so far? What are you, what are you, what are you kind of getting, hearing from people? Well, you know, it's always a lovely moment, Marty, to you know, put your work out there, whether it's pressing publish on a post, sending out a newsletter or uh, a book into the wild. But I think there's something about a book, which is, you know, a labor of love. Uh, This book, you know, I wrote in quite a short time frame, but it was relying on raw material that I had for, you know, like been accumulating for like 15 years. So it's always one of those moments when you put it out there, it's exhilarating and you're like, how are people going to receive it? And the lovely thing is to get those messages from people um, who have stumbled upon the book in a bookstore or found it online or had it recommended. And, you know, everyone's different and it's lovely to get people's take on it. You know, I got a I got an email from a guy called David in the Netherlands uh, who said it was really helping him kind of recalibrate, pressing reset for his work life. Uh, a musician in Sheffield in the north of England who was buying Christmas presents and uh, decided to buy himself a Christmas present when he saw it in the bookstore and how it was helping him rethink his life. So, you know, I love all those. I love ha- having all that kind of reader feedback. It's always it's always very exciting. And, you know, the interesting thing, Marty, is sometimes people are uh, using the book or taking value from it in a way that I might not have thought. And I think that's mm. the nice thing about putting your work out there. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, the book includes, uh, and I think you say it, or I read it someplace here, that uh, you include in the book, uh, I'll call it a cast of characters. Um, there's quite a few folks that uh, you're either friends with or you know of or have you read about, but there's also a lot of stories, uh, your personal stories. And we're going to talk about some of the stories in the book, but 
Um, can you mention some of the stories that you say in the book that that your own from your own personal journey? Is there anything that, that you would come to mind that you know that you talk about uh, in, in the book? From my own personal journey, I mean, there's, yes. you know, there's a there's a there's a lot in there. I think a a, a, a standout moment for me that's at the heart of the book is actually something I talk about in the introduction, which mm-hmm. is about um and and it's all around the theme of the choices we make. Every day we're faced with choices, some of them seemingly quite mundane and trivial, and others more significant. And in the introduction, I tell a story about being in Germany in September 2019, having just given a presentation at a company's offsite. And I had a choice of how to spend my time before the taxi would come to take me to Munich airport. And um, the the choice was to catch up on email or to go and discover a lake, which was at the bottom of the hill where the offsite was happening. It was in the Bavarian Alps. So the choice was jump on the Wi-Fi or jump in the lake. And um, I jumped in the lake. And as I put it in the book, uh, Marty, it was, a, it was a crystallizing moment to remind myself that we can live our lives straightjacketed by what we think we should do, or we, should, or we can live a life aligned with who we really are and make those kind of choices. Now, I know that story comes from a position of privilege. We're not all going to have a lake to jump into. But I think it's a kind of metaphor for um, knowing what is sacred to us and making the right mm-hmm. choices. and. Uh, you know, I, I, I shine a light on that particular story because, as you can hear, it's something that's really stayed with me and is sure. a touchstone to remind me about making the right choices in life. I know that you have built what you call and others have called, a, 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 I'll call it an unconventional career out of following your curiosity and sharing what you learned. What, what makes your career unconventional? Talk to me about that. Well, I guess um, it's been a career which perhaps is more common for a lot of people listening and watching this, um, that a, a career where I haven't followed a conventional, you know, linear uh, journey, where I haven't had a career ladder. And I suppose the point of transformation for me is when I quit organizational life um, 22 years ago, when I decided to work for myself. And the way I think about working for myself has been a work life with no borders. You know, I I had, I used to have a blog in the early noughties called no walls, no rules, (laughs) bit cheesy, but you know, the whole idea being that this is a work life without parameters and that um, I could go where the water flows and use a word that's often used now, pivot, change direction. And it's given me a wonderful, um, some wonderful experiences. Uh, mm-hmm. It's also given me an opportunity to um, take my time, I suppose, to kind of find my path and find my groove. Um, so I guess in that sense, it's it's unconventional. And in another sense, it's all been about what I would call plurality. It's about being multidimensional. And mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of people in my network have done one thing their whole career. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. One role, one discipline. And for me, I've preferred to kind of keep it broad. And I know that resonates with with how you like to operate your podcast, sure. everything else you do. Uh, breadth, uh, well, depth is important as well, right? But but um, sure. but but I like being broad. Yeah, well, that's what really stuck in my head from our first chat, you know. And I, I wish I could get the exact quote, but you basically said your business is not your life. And, uh, you know, yeah, and, you're, and, and, it's your life, not a business model. <laughs> it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, for pointing out because <laughs> that stuck with them. That basic concept stuck with me. And uh, and I tweeted about that and I put that out quite a bit. You know, a question I want to ask you uh, again, the title is the book, 365 Ways to Have a Good Day. And it's obviously there's 365 days in the year. I read the book quickly in preparation for our discussion. and. Uh, But I'd like your advice or your thoughts. I don't think I saw this in the book. How would you suggest that people read this book? I mean, I could see it doing it a day at a time. I could see sitting right through it and taking copious notes. I I, I, I can see myself rereading this almost on a daily basis. So, So what's your advice? What's your thoughts? Well, I guess we're all different. And I think uh, the anecdotal feedback I've heard from people is how they use it in different ways. Someone is looking at it 
one idea at a time. Uh, they did get it mm-hmm. uh, before the Christmas period and they decided to wait until January 1 to start going through it. But other people are reading it rapidly. And I think the headline is, it's a book you can dip into. You know, the 365 mm-hmm. ways, uh, let me be honest, if my publisher was sitting next to me and my lovely editor, Ian, he might slap my wrist. You know, there is not, you are not going to take all 365 ideas and apply them to your life. You know, that you, we're all different. Some are going to resonate and some are going to be, well, this isn't for you, but thank you for illuminating it, Ian, or whatever. So I think the idea that we can dip into it and the super short chapters, which are, you know, like 150 words long, we can read them so rapidly. They're shorter than a blog post. It's a nice constraint as a writer. And I love what you just said about revisiting it because uh, a friend of mine, Zodi, says she has it on her bedside table and she'll just pick it up and take a page at random. And it might be something she's read before or it might not, but it always gives her some some sense of uh, optimism or inspiration. And that's that's lovely. I love I love it that people might use it like that. Well, I picked out some that uh, that I wanted to talk about, so I guess that's my personal viewpoint. That hope others will will find it. They they resonated with me, so uh, hopefully others will enjoy this. Uh, you know, me picking out some of my favorites. And uh, number twenty two out of the three hundred and sixty five is it says in the title of number twenty two, "Be who you needed when you were younger." Be who you needed when you were younger. What do you talk about there? Well, you know, I wish I could remember exactly uh, where that quote came from. I remember seeing a meme on Instagram or Twitter where someone had a grab of be who you needed where you were younger. And I would have attributed it if I could, but I borrowed it. And something that really struck me because I think we often have moments in our journey, in our life journeys, where we get lost or we struggle. Or we have no one around us to say, go on, Ian, go on, Marty, you're doing the right thing. And uh, often, perhaps, we find our state itself at a later stage in life where we go, you know what, what I'm doing now, how I'm helping others would be great for my younger self. And I suppose I've got an example of that, in which I tell in uh, chapter 22, which is um, as, a, as a teenage boy at school, I had a great ambition to work in what we call broadcasting, you know, television and radio. It was a dream, my teenage dream. I was passionate about it. And my headmaster at school said, you know, it's too competitive and you should really kind of, you know, forget it. It ain't going to happen. And I'm really glad I ignored his advice and I proved him wrong. And I spent quite a few years working in television and radio. And when I got an invitation from the careers uh, teacher at school, um, probably when I'd I'd been out of school probably nine years, maybe 10 years, and I was now managing director of a media business in London. You know, I was really busy. I thought, have I got time to take a trip out of town to go and talk at my old school? And then I realized, you know what? Be who you needed when you were younger. Go and tell those kids at school that, you know, wanting to work in video effects, wanting to be a movie director, wanting to work in uh, TV uh design or whatever, you know, isn't a crazy idea and to mm. give them some sense of um, optimism. So I guess, you know, there's other ways that might manifest. But for me, that was a way of, you know, and in fact, that's fueled other things I've done where I've done, um, you know, guest lecturing at universities yeah. and schools. And yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, there was a vacuum when I was, uh, you know, 30 years ago. To, so to go and do it now uh, and try and help and give words of encouragement, I think, um, it's not just yeah. about an obligation. I feel that I, I look at it often through the lens of my younger self and how how much difference that would have made. You know, it's it is very well. I find it. I agree. Uh, I find it healthy to go back to oh, you know, what what excited me when I was you know younger, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old. And other than girls, uh, I had to think of other things, um, but that came to my mind first. Oh, let's not dwell on that. I'm sorry I brought that up, Ian. You know, uh, but. <laughs> It is. It is very. It was. It's helpful to me. I refer to that now. I thought maybe that was just because I was getting older that I was thinking like that, uh, you know. But I found I found that very inspirational. Um, chapter thirty three. And by the way, folks, you're already noticing that Ian is a hell of a storyteller, and that's what his <laughs> business is built. And he teaches others how to do that. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. It says start a self storytelling habit. Start a self 
storytelling habit. Give me more details on that. Well, I guess uh, some of that goes back to my teenage years as well, but I think it's about um, the power of writing things down. I was on vacation mm -hmm. last week in New York City with my family and my boys, and uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I was pleased to see them with their journals, scribbling notes as they were uh, as we were <laughs> away, and uh, I have my uh, my New York City moleskin here uh, or notepad full of full of notes on on that. And I think when we you know, keep a journal or make notes of a special trip. It's lovely to look back on. And the story I tell in the book about starting a self storytelling habit goes back to uh, my when I was 18 and I went on a wonderful rail adventure around Europe. Mm -hmm. And rediscovering that scrapbook, uh, ticket stubs, receipts, little journal entries, rediscovering that uh, in my 40s, um, so a little while ago now, but rediscovering that in my forties kind of was a was almost like you know unearthing a, or dusting off a compass that helped me s connect the dots between where I was then and who I am now, and how some of those hallmarks of me as a young man, mm -hmm. storyteller, explorer, being very curious, were present in the forty something, and indeed now you know as a fifty three year old, still present in the fifty three year old Ian. So. I'm glad that I kind of laid the trail, if you were, laid the breadcrumbs for that. And, um, you know, I, had, I don't have a lot of um, journal entries and things I can go back to from that time because I just haven't kept them. But I was really glad that I kept my journal that special experience. And, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, did you did you journal as a teenager? Was it, was, were you someone who wrote no. things down? No, I, and I, I've been hit and miss uh, over my entire career on that. No. What I have kept and is kind of scary. My wife thinks it's scary. Is a, and I know you're in to-do list. Uh, you know, you work with to-do list. I do too. And people say that's maybe limiting. They have different. There's different viewpoints on that. I have my uh, legal pads from probably 12 years, 15 years okay. ago. I can go back and you know, and sometimes it gets a little scary because when I work for other people, I say, "Well, where was I and what was I saying?" <laughs> But it, it's a pretty amazing because there is a whole story that goes through my whole life. There is a theme that goes through my life that that you really don't think about, especially when you're going down that that zigzag path, you know. But there, there's yeah. there's consi some consistencies over it, right? Let's talk about what you do for others now. In addition to writing books, your website is iansanders.com. That's correct. Yeah. So what will we find when we go to that website? What does it talk about there? What, what do you do for others, for organizations? Uh, do a commercial for you. For oh, well, right thank now. you very much. I mean, what I do for organizations and others falls into two categories, really. The first one is around storytelling. I help leaders and teams um, tell better stories in the workplace. I think stories are the most valuable vehicle we have for communication. We've just proved that in the last few minutes. And uh, I, I think they can really humanize communications inside companies. So I love working with teams, getting them thinking about how they can tell better stories through workshops and training programs. And the other half of what I do is uh, help leaders and teams um, have more good days at work. You know, so simple, right? But so essential. And yeah. through through one-on-one -on -one walk and talks and workshops. And uh, I guess the book is part of that really. Uh, come from, I've been doing uh, sessions for a few years now um, called, what's called More Good Days at Work, a kind of lunch and learn or uh, online or in-person session. And um, just getting getting people in the workplace thinking about the habits and behaviors that make them most productive, most creative, uh, healthy and happy at work um, we're working harder than ever in a way aren't we and uh, especially yes. working from home and I think it's just so important to stop press the pause button and think about uh, what we each need and as you know that's very much at the heart of the book as well sure point out to everyone that you uh, you do your work all over the world literally yeah. And, uh, you know, you said you were in New York recently, and I know you've been to New York. I know you've traveled all over the world. You you refer to a lot of your experiences and, and journeys in the book, which I, I found very, I find very interesting and very fascinating. It it, it gives you depth. Okay. You know, we, we talked earlier that, you know, we certainly have, uh, we've gone different routes in our careers and we've learned different things. 
But that experience as traveling, and you point that out in the book, traveling and your experience all over the world gives your work depth, in my opinion. So okay, thank I just you. That's, to that's good to know. Uh, you know, I think, to be honest, I've always been someone that gets creatively energized by a journey. It doesn't have to be a transatlantic one. It might be a Eurostar, which is our train we can take from London to Paris and further afield, um, or, a tr- or a train ride to Scotland or a short plane ride to Ireland. Um, those have been the kind of little trips that have always energized me. And I guess so many of them are in the book because... Uh, as you might recall, a lot of the books, raw materials came from this collection of journals that yes. I got kind of, I mined, yes. as it were, I unearthed all these little stories. So a lot of them are anchored in experiences, whether that's a, a bizarre experience of feeding a rabbit at Madrid Airport. I don't know if you found that one yet. Or, uh, I did. I uh, remember. Yeah. <laughs> or feeling, uh, you know, feeling on fire, uh, sitting outside a wonderful coffee shop in the sunshine um, in uh, in another city or whatever. So it's interesting. Thanks for your reflection. I guess they're born out of kind of, you know, what's in Ian's DNA, you know, which is this love of journeys of where I feel, you know, most energized. And I think people hearing that and reading what you're, what could be the journey of just as you're saying, it could be getting in your car or driving cross town to a coffee shop that you've never gone into and, and bringing that book, bringing this book or bringing a book, uh, and just uh, kind of calming yourself down and just say, look, I'm not, I'm not going to log on. I'm not, you know, I, and you talk about that. We've already talked. I, I think that's so important. I just want to, um, you know, bring that up again. Chapter yeah. 48, it says, tune into those two inch events, tune into those two inch events. I love this. Part of the reason is because I love the book Creativity Incorporated. Yeah. It's a phenomenal book. I want. I want to, in addition to your book. I, I suggest people get this book, Creativity Incor- Incorporated. But tell me uh, about tune into those two inch events. Well, I'm with you on that book. It's actually sitting behind me on my favorite bookshelf, Creativity. Inc. There you go, by Ed Catmull. It's it's on the end, just about where my finger is. Um, okay. So yeah, Ed Catmull, co-founder of Pixar. Uh, wrote a wonderful book, Creativity Inc. I learned a lot about the culture of organizations, about creativity, about being honest with feedback. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree. echo what you said. I would recommend that to your listeners. Um, yeah, I love this concept that he talked about in the book, which is what he called a two-inch event. So when, uh, when Ed Catmull was uh, a child, he went on a road trip with his family and they went up a winding canyon road and they had, a, they had an accident. And when they got out of the car, they were all all right. But the, but he looked and he saw that if the car was two inches uh, to one side, the car would have plunged down the canyon. And it was one of those moments. I think we've all had them, haven't we? We went, phew, Whew, that was a close one. And he calls it a two inch event. And, you know, as I put in the book, you know, imagine, you know, if it gone down the canyon, plunged down the canyon, there'd be no Ed Catmull, there'd be no Pixar, there'd be no Up, there'd be no Inside Story and all these wonderful, uh, Inside Out, sorry, all these wonderful, wonderful Pixar films that we know and love. And why I wanted to illuminate that one in the book is because I think so many of my positive moments in my working life and my life at large have come from two inch events, not from some massive plan. And what I mean by that is sometimes they feel quite random, meeting someone, uh, bumping into someone in a coffee shop that might then turn into a working relationship. And uh, I have so many of these in my in, in my uh, storied life that I feel it's about, my, my, my kind of advice for the reader is about staying open-minded and kind of tuning tuning in for these things that are happening around us. You know, when we're busy, Marty, we can we can be going into coffee shops, we could be walking, you know, from the subway to our office and we've got our headphones in, we've got our head down. And it's just about having a different mindset. And I think when we stay curious and we tune into these two inch events, you know, two each two inches from um, from opportunity and all these things around us, I think our lives and our working lives can be much richer for it. And is it not much, isn't it very energizing 
because of the experiences that you usually have by just looking up and looking around and being a little more sensitive to or, or being more in touch with what's around you, isn't it just energizing? Absolutely. I told a story on LinkedIn today about a wonderful restaurant we went to in uh, the West Village in New York City last week, last Monday, a week ago today. And uh, uh, we it was a restaurant I'd read about only 24 hours earlier, but I had no sense of going there. And we were just walking around uh, Greenwich Village, no map. I didn't have my phone out. And I was literally leading my family, my wife and two kids saying, well, let's go over there. Following my nose, we stumbled upon this, upon this wonderful restaurant, Bouvette. Uh, and um, I think it, I kind of think of that as a two inch event. We very nearly might we nearly might have missed it because we it was just kind of the route we took and you know I could have looked it up online and planned it and booked it but it wouldn't have been the same if I that sense of wonder of stumbling upon a lovely you know it was a special treat kind of venue you know it wasn't your everyday diner it was a, a special treat yeah. meal but after these years of not being able to travel and lockdown to be there with my wife and two boys and just we sat there ordered our meal some jazz was playing. And I said to my two teenage sons, Barney and Dylan, I said, just take this in. It doesn't get better than this, you know. And it was just a wonderful <laughs> moment full of joy and as you can hear in my voice, right? <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, hitting some of my favorites. Uh, again, my guest is Ian Sanders. His book is 365 Ways to Have a Good Day. We're obviously talking about some of the uh, things that uh, he has written about in the book. And uh, obviously he's telling stories from his life and from his book, which is uh, obviously he's very engaging. So we mentioned my friend, our friend, Kelly Hoey, and she's in the book uh, two or three times. Um, the first one I noticed, I think, was uh, chapter 98. And it said, schedule some self-care. By the way, I sent. Uh, Kelly a note yesterday after reading that and saying enjoy your self care moment. <laughs> oh, great. Well, yeah. So, we, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just say we, you know, we are sitting here today because of because of our wonderful mutual friend Kelly, and you know, I thought it was important, and so did my editor when I was writing this book, that not to base it one hundred percent on my own experiences. That'd be a bit boring. But I reached out to a lot of people in my network and had some wonderful calls and Zoom calls and phone calls and face to face where I could to ask them about some of their advice for having a good day. And what I love yeah. about Kelly is Kelly has some wonderful, you know, I guess we'd call them rituals at the heart of her life to keep her um, keep her on track. And I really admire that about Kelly. And she told me about, you know, a Sunday evening ritual self-care where she just gets herself ready for the week ahead and finds herself in a position of calm. And um, sometimes it might be uh, reading a book, watching a movie, or she has an infrared blanket, which is kind of like a sauna thing. So I thought it was a wonderful call to action for us all. A lot of us lead very busy lives. And I love that sense of Sunday evening self-care, just kind of getting ready for whatever the week's going to throw at us. So thank you, Kelly, for um, for that one. Yeah. What I really liked about it is that uh, I'm guilty of doing a lot of work on Sunday night. And I'm sure a lot of who are listening to do the same thing. It's kind of like, you know, I, I, I that's where I kind of zone into things. And that's probably preparation. But I don't do enough of the self-care. I, 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 it may just like what you want this book to do. It, it did with me. And I said, you know what? Okay. Get your work done. But when you get your work done, whatever that takes you 15 minutes or an hour, 15 minutes, you know, kind of back off, you know, make the popcorn, sit out on the porch, do whatever. That's a different point of view than just work and work and work and preparing for the week by having your head down in your notepad or on your, on your laptop. So that's what I liked about, about Kelly's uh, advice oh, there. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think it's important that, uh, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is tuning in to when we're at our best and when we feel motivated yeah. to do things. And I'll be honest, I'm like you. Sometimes on a Sunday, if I'm really feeling like now is when I feel motivated to write the blog post, to look at my to-do list, I will do that. But I guess it's about balance, isn't it? If we're going to do that on a Sunday evening, 
maybe not beat ourselves up too much, but find some time in the week where we're going to kind of make up the difference, as it were, whether we work for ourselves or whether we work yeah. inside an organization, because I think that's when it becomes unsustainable, you know, it's too full on. So um, I think we can yeah. take Kelly's advice, you know, if it works for you, do it a Sunday evening, but maybe there's a, maybe it's a Friday evening and work early, or maybe it's, you know, another, another night of the week where you can just get yeah. unplugged and replicate that, uh, that experience. Yeah, my experience, uh, I've been self-employed most of my adult life. So uh, I have found in myself and with others, a lot of other people I know, that we can work ourselves to death. And we don't have anybody else sitting around us telling us what to do or giving us orders or saying, you know, you need to do this by 5 o'clock. We have a uh, response. Now, we may have teammates. We have people that help us in different things. But ultimately... And I found myself going through like I could work myself into a complete frazzle. I mean, our producer, Dan Kimbrough, he usually doesn't speak, but he's the same way. He'll he'll crank and crank and crank, uh, you know. So I think that advice to to take that coffee break, that tea break, go for a ride, go go whatever, uh, uh, and or to follow Kelly's rule, I think is so important. Did, did yeah. you did you experience that in your own life that you could work twenty four hours a day? You bet. I think uh, in my 22 years of being self-employed, if I'm honest, in the first 10 years, I think I was replicating a kind of version of presenteeism. You know, I was my own boss, as you are, as millions of people are, many, most people listening to this are, many people listening to this are. Yet I had the freedom, but I was beating myself up on what I call presenteeism. It's six thirty. Uh, I better not. If I was working at home, I better not go downstairs because I, you know, really ought to work a bit longer. And it was like I wasn't one. I wasn't asking myself, "Are you productive? How are you feeling?" I wasn't checking in with myself. Exactly. I was just, I was just uh, replicating, you know, a version of presenteeism. So, yeah, I probably learned the hard way because you know I did have some ill health and stress related things, and that was a wake up call to um, come on here yeah. and you've got the freedom. So why aren't you? Why aren't you making the most of it? Yeah, that's why we need to read and reflect, learn from others, get get read good blogs, read posts from good people. Um, that will help you to say, oh, okay, let me let me just let me just mm -hmm. stop for a minute. Um, let's see, two eighty one, uh, chapter two eighty one. It says, keep your emotional bandwidth broad. And you talk about a book, The Other Side of Happiness, by a gentleman by the name of Brock Bastian. Hmm. Keep your emotional bandwidth broad. What does that mean? Tell me more. Well, I, I really recommend the book by Brock Bastian. It's called The Other Side of Happiness. I think we're all aware, aren't we? There's a, there's a kind of happiness movement in the self-help kind of category. And, you know, I see it myself when I go into bookstores to see if my book's there and you see all these other books about, you know, how to be happy and all this kind of thing. And I think, you know, what I wanted to make the point of for 365 Ways to Have a Good Day is, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating a world which is shiny, 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 where everything's awesome and we're all going to have a good day because that's not human life, is it? Uh, as my friend Jerry Colonna says, you know, that he talks about the glory and the mess of being human. <laughs> and ain't that the truth? You know, we've all had our struggles. And what Brock Bastian uh, gave me some wonderful language, this sense of emotional bandwidth. He said that if we, wanna, if we want to have a life with less pain and struggle to be more happy, then that means we're going to narrow our emotional bandwidth. And that means that we're going to dull, you know, might feel a nice thing. Oh, yeah, can we have less pain and struggle and more happiness, please? But he was kind of saying, I think perhaps as we all know deep down, we need that light and shade. We need those ups and downs. Um, yeah. When we have those ups and downs in our health, in our relationships, in our mental health, in our business lives, you know, they're tough, aren't they? But the, the highs are sweeter. Um, and I, I think it's just it's just you know, it's just being human. And um, a friend of mine, Emily, who's a um, psychotherapist who I interviewed for the book said, you know, she challenged me quite rightly on the notion of, you know, having a good day, because she argued a bit like Brock Bastian, that having a day where everything is awesome, um, isn't realistic, and yeah. wouldn't be such a good day as one might think. So, you know, there was a good reminder, I think, about, um, 
having a day with light and shade, having a life with light and shade, not every day is going to be amazing. Light and shade. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, chapter three, 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 three hundred and thirty three. Obviously, I skipped a lot in the middle. <laughs> we don't want to give them too much. <laughs> we, they need to buy the book and follow you on, <laughs> on your social media. Um, but I like this one, too. Uh, it says, stop, stop chasing the if onlys, mm. the if onlys. Ah, boy. Talk about this one. This is a big one. <laughs> oh, this is a big one for me, Marty. It really was. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, and I think that the, the kind of punchline, if we can go to the punchline straight away and then I'll unpack it, you know, the punchline is about kind of living in the now rather than always chasing the future. And I'll give you an example of it, which I have, have in the chapter, which is uh, for many years in my self-employed life, uh, I was struggling with being precarious. And I said to myself, things would be better if I could find a home for myself three days a week. Wouldn't that be great if I could find a contract, a gig as a freelancer, as a contractor, as an independent consultant where a company would say, yeah, we'd, we'll have three days a week of you, Ian. I thought that'd be great. I can go in an office, be in a workspace with co-workers. I've got a stability. And then the other two days I can kind of experiment. I don't need to worry about revenues, et cetera, et cetera. And I talked to my friends about this and they went, great idea. Talk to my father yeah three days a week that's what you want to chase so I, I i made a flyer i put things out to my contacts i would go and have coffees with people and say what i really want is a three day a week thing bottom line it didn't happen you know i had those conversations with companies where they went well actually maybe would, would you like to come and work for us we'd love you five days a week i was no 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 i want this three days a week thing <laughs> and i spent all this time and energy and i'll be honest it was a I'm not talking just a period of a few months. This was a period of a few years. I was like, I just need the three day a week gig. That's what I need. And then I'll be happy. And then my finances will be better. I have more, I can breathe. I can sit back. And I realized that I was chasing something that was very elusive. I realized that you'll know this. Uh, I know you talk about this yourself, that the trade off of a self-employed life is incredible freedom and flexibility and independence but sometimes the trade-off is you don't have an incredible amount of uh, long-term stability that is the trade-off you can't have both things so you yeah. know it, it, as soon as i stopped chasing the if only i went look let's just remove that because it ain't gonna happen or it might happen but it might happen more randomly like a two-inch event we were talking about earlier as soon as i stopped chasing the if only on the horizon oh i'm looking you know my binoculars i'm looking for the if only and then just went let's just carry on with what you've got because it's all right yeah it's a bit precarious but you know you'll survive it was a real game changer in feeling happier about what i had valuing what i had and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah so yeah it was a big, big part of it yeah yeah do good work. Do good work. I've been podcasting. I've been doing shows many, many, many years. If I can tell my own personal story very quickly, because this please. is about you. Uh, but I repeatedly have been asked, well, how did you monetize your podcast? Uh, I, I'd be asked that all the time. And I said, well, you know, at first, that's where I was. That If only I could generate, you know, so for... <laughs> I feel like such a slow learner. It took me so long. I'm like, why do I care about, I mean, I'm doing okay. Fine. Why everybody's telling me I have to monetize my podcast. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I just want to do a good show. <laughs> I want to talk to good people and I want to learn from them. In the end, when I started to think that way, I probably changed myself. I probably changed my approach to everything. I became much more relaxed. And the guests that I got, I learned so much more for. It. And I'm telling you that part of my success at this age is a direct result of me not giving a damn about monetizing my podcast. Because all I worried about, all I did, Dan will verify this. He knows he's been with me a long time. I never talk about it. I, 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 all I talk about is let's do a good show. Let's have good people. Let's share good stories. And as a result of that, it's paid dividends for me. So do good work. Am I okay saying that? Oh, well, I love that. 
No, I love that experience because it really echoes my own philosophy. And I think that starting point of doing good work and, you know, you're putting good work out there, aren't you? You're inspiring people, you're helping people on their own journeys. And I think it also, I, I also love it because I think it speaks to, uh, you know, our mutual philosophy that I, that I labeled, um, it's your life, not a business model, which, yeah. which is that, you know, we don't have to monetize every waking hour. We don't have to. The point of being self-employed is perhaps to create a portfolio of things that we want to do. Some, some are about dollars and some aren't. And isn't it liberating? Isn't it refreshing to do something and just go, you know, I did a few little 2020. I lost some work and had time on my hands in that first lockdown of the spring and uh, did a few little experiments, little kind of video conversations and uh, a friend of mine said something similar about, yeah, I mean, you're going to right, you're going to need to build an audience and you need to uh, get your numbers up and then you go to a brand. And I was like, I'm just kind of experimenting in the trenches. I like it. And I'm not if you if you talk to me about building an audience, it felt a bit alien to what I was trying to do. I was just trying to feel my way around, invite some people yeah. onto uh, for a video chat and put it out on YouTube. So you know, a very formative stage, never, never gone to your, your heights, Marty, but uh, no, I love that. And I think, isn't it liberating and refreshing to hear that very much? Well, it's so, it's so educational for us. Um, we intentionally or unintentionally, we share what we've learned from others, whether it's the book or it's the podcast and whether we intentionally try to inspire people, you do. Yeah. I mean, you just do. And, um, so I've been blessed, uh, by being able to do that. So let's wrap up this way. Um, what have I missed? What do you want to make sure that you tell us or that I didn't ask you or, um, mm -hmm. yeah. What did I miss? Tell me. Well, I love though. I'm always curious about when I talk to talk on a podcast, which the host is going to zoom in on. So, um, I thought those six were, were, were a lovely kind of mix of them. And I, and I think for your listener, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to say that you missed anything. I mean, I think if, if people pick up the book, they'll find something there for them. But I think if there's some, one thing I want to highlight, perhaps in wrapping up, it's that um, I, th I think the key to having having a good day is twofold. It's about paying attention to what uh, you need as an individual to have a good day, the habits, the behaviors, the mindsets that give us those good days. And then two, to be intentional about building that into our life. So that is my call to action. That's the heart of the book. Attention and intention, paying attention to what we need and being intentional about building a life around that. And that simple formula has been a bit of a game changer for me. And as you said in the intro, you know, I'm all about sparking change. So I would love that people would pick up the book, try something new, and be intentional with it and put things into action and experiment, think like a designer and and see the benefits of these small changes that, you know, I know from my own experience can make a big difference to the quality of your life. Yeah. Ian, uh, thank you so much. Ian's book, again, is 365 Ways to Have a Good Day, a day-by-day -day guide to living your best life. You can read it any way you like. I would suggest you do keep it on your night table or somewhere where you will see it. Uh, I like to leave things in the living room when people come in and I like to show that I, I read like I'm smart. It kind of, <laughs> But then it also gives me an opportunity to say, you should look at this book. This is a terrific book. So this is going in my living room. I'm going to have a lot of guests over the holidays. So I'll put it in the living room. IanSanders.com is his website. You'll want to follow him on social media. You can find him on Twitter, correct? You can yeah. find him on LinkedIn. Yeah. And um, he blogs. He talks about different things. If you're an organization, you should consider bringing him in. You should really connect with Ian. He is um, he's special. You're a special guy, and I, I appreciate you coming on the show, and I, I really appreciate uh, what you've been able to teach me in the last few years. So thank you so much for being part of the Business Builder Show. Oh, thank you, Marty. I loved uh, revisiting uh, uh, the podcast, having a conversation, really loved your questions and your insights. So thank you so much for having me on.